So we are we are live. Uh, go ahead, Vishwas. Thank you, thank you, Shweta. Hello, everyone. G uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on whichever time zone you are in. I'm Vishwas, member of the leadership team of the ISWA YPG, co-founder of the research working group, and the deputy chair for this for this conference. I am working as a technical director with Value Investment Colombia. This is a sustainable infrastructure company based out of Bogota, Colombia. I have a master in sanitary engineering and waste management and over 10 years of experience in waste management in India, Germany and in Colombia. Uh, thank you all for attending the conference and we're really looking forward to it. Uh, before we start the conference, I would like to brief you on who are we as who is, what is ISWA YPG and why are we organizing this online conference. Today's online conference, as all of you know, is themed the ultimate journey from dump sites to a circular economy, best practices and innovation solutions for low and middle income countries. The, just to give you a background, the ISWA YPG is a large group of professionals under the age of 35 in over 40 countries. We have over 100 members across different time zones. And we started in 2013 in Vienna with the four main objectives. First is to promote sustainable production, consumption, and disposal practices. Second is, of course, knowledge sharing and be best practices sharing across the world. Third is to collaborate to find solutions to both local and global waste management problems. And the fourth is to help young professionals advance in their careers. We, in 2013, at the World Congress in Vienna, the group was formed. And then we started meeting every year in, in different world congresses. We met in Sao Paulo, and then Belgium, Serbia, uh, Baltimore, Kuala Lumpur, and this year in Bilbao. But during the years, the YPG has grown very diverse. So we now have working groups uh, within the YPG focused on communications and uh, communications, education, uh, uh, research, which which is basically hosting this conference group and various other groups. In 2015, we started something called as the mentorship group, where you have really big experts within ISWA mentoring young professionals build their career or in whichever field of uh, waste management they choose to. Then we started launching the regional groups. Today we have regional groups in India, Pakistan, Azerbaijan, Ukraine, Germany, Brazil, Colombia, a lot of other countries where we are starting off with, with local groups. And in 2017, we decided it's important that we are doing so many activities on waste management to have a focus. So in 2017, we started with a flagship project. With first year, we started mapping the big, big waste management uh, problems. Because when you ask people, what are the biggest waste management challenges in your country? The, the question is very simple, but the answer is very different based on your ge geography. So we did that, and this led to a big flagship project in 2018 called What Happens to Your Waste? I will explain you briefly in a couple of minutes. And this year, we have the flagship project of closing dump sites, of which this conference is a part. So in 2018, we did the What Happens to My Waste campaign. This campaign literally means the same. So this had three parts. The first part is an awareness campaign where we try to answer the question, what happens to my waste? People could co post pictures. Let's say you have a plastic bottle around you and you post a picture in the Facebook group asking what happens to my waste. So you have expert from your country or your geography answering what happens to pet bottles or plastic bottles in your, in your country. So this was an awareness program uh, or a awareness campaign which we started and it, and it and it went really well. The second part was the online conference. We organized the first online conference focused on waste management problems in Southeast Asia with together with Be Waste Wise, uh, who are also helping us with this conference. And, uh, and the third was an education survey, so which is still ongoing. We start, because there's so many toolkits and education material available in the world, we started consolidating different materials and we gave out awards to the best education campaigns. In, in, in Kuala Lumpur. These are some examples of how it looked. People started posting pictures of dump sites and recycling facilities and started asking what happens to my waste. And we, we had experts coming in and explaining what happens to uh, different streams and according to their questions. And this year, the flagship project is on closing dump sites. Again, we have three parts. The first part is about campaign for closing dump sites. 
And this year we have gone ahead and started an Indigo campaign. Indigo campaign. This is a crowdfunding campaign where we are trying to raise about 10,000 euros in 60 days. We are a week uh, old in this campaign and we've already reached 15% of our funding. So all the funds that we raise will go towards campaign for closing dump sites projects, the, which ISWA is, is doing. The second is a blog writing competition, which is still open. And uh, the, the topic is how do we get from dump sites to a circular economy? So, and this year we have very exciting awards. The first, the first prize will actually be a full scholarship for, for the participants to go to Texas for the ISFA Winter School. I have been part of this winter school in the past and I would say it's, it's amazing. I would recommend all of you to uh, participate in this. And the third is the online conference, which we are, which we are having today. Uh, yesterday we had day one, we had some amazing presentations and I'm sure we're going to have the same today. We had two keynotes yesterday by Antonis, uh, the ISFA president and Zoe from Wasted UK. Today we have an exciting talk ahead from Rashi Agarwal from Banyan Nation and uh, followed up, followed by all the presentations. Uh, this is the schedule that, that we are talking today. Uh, it's it's uh, we have two moderators, Shivali and Vishwesh, who will moderate the whole sessions, and they will brief you on how to go about it. Please, uh, it's important that you know during your sessions you stick to the time limit uh, because we have eight presentations during the sessions today. This is the big keynote that we are expecting in few minutes. It's going to be on revolutionizing plastic recycling in India. This is a very exciting project and campaign, which is uh, which is run by Banyan Nation and Rashi Agarwal, and they will and she will speak about it. And uh, I would I would like to acknowledge a few people before we proceed with the conference. Of course, the chair Rami and secretary Mohammed, who helped pull design this conference uh, for a very long time. Our coordinator Shivali, she's done a great, a great deal of work. Moderators again, Shivali and Vishwesh for today, and Natalia who did it yesterday. And the scientific committee consisting of Rami, Andrea, Valentina, Dr. Frida, and and myself. So uh, to come to the to begin the conference, uh, firstly, I wish you all a great conference and all the best for all your presentations. Uh, this is a very complex topic, but all your presentations are going to help us uh, find solutions. And, you know, this is going to be an integrated approach. We need efforts from everyone to solve this big challenge. About 40% of all the world's waste today end up in dump sites and more than half the world don't have access to scientific collection or treatment facilities. So it requires all of us to work towards this. And uh, we're all looking forward to hear from you on what you have to uh, present about your research. Uh, thank you very much and all the best for today. I pass on the mic to Shweta from Be Waste Twice for a quick welcome. Hi, uh, thank you. Thank you, Vishwas. So hi, I am uh, Shweta Bandapani. I am the community builder at Be Waste Twice. And we are very happy that we are partners with uh, ISWA YPG for the second online conference as well. Yesterday was day one. We did have some great presentations. We had some great audience interaction as well. People were very engaged and we were very happy about that. Uh, before we move on with today, I'm just going to quickly introduce you to what we do at BWasteWise. We are a nonprofit organization addressing the need for knowledge dissemination and waste management. We try to bring the best minds in the world together to build a global waste community. So we provide educational resources, access to experts, networking opportunities. Uh, we manage grants, we provide consultancy services in knowledge transfer and training, in networking and community building, uh, conference support like we're doing here, uh, communications and content marketing, and of course, waste management. We have had, we have webinars running almost throughout the year. You can go to the video panel section in our menu to check out the webinars that we have. We have uh, webinars on the wide gamut of issues surrounding waste management. And before I hand this back to uh, before I hand this back to Vishwas, I want to remind you that there is a live chat box below the live stream. Please use that to pose your questions for the keynote speakers as well as the presenters, and we will take those questions up uh, during the Q and A session. So thank you all for being here. I'm handing this back to Vishwas. 
Thank you very much, Shweta. BeBase has been amazing, uh, and we've been collaborating since last year, and we hope to collaborate with them uh, throughout throughout this campaign. And without much further delay, uh, I would like to. I'm taking great pleasure in introducing our keynote speaker, Mrs. Rashi Agarwal, Director of Partnerships at Banyan Nation Recycling. Rashi is the Director of Partnerships at Banyan Nation, an award-winning plastic recycling and waste management company based out of Hyderabad, India. Prior to Banyan Nation, Rashi headed the India office of the Impact Investment Exchange, where she helped several social enterprises across South and Southeast Asia raise capital. Rashi has an MBA from Columbia Business School and Electrical Engineering and Economics degree from the University of California at Irvine. Let's welcome again Mrs. Rashi Agarwal. Uh, Rashi, the floor is yours. Hi, everyone. Um, glad all of you. Is my ma Can you guys hear me? Yes, yes, Rashi. Great. Um, so uh, glad everyone can join from. Uh, various time zones and at uh, you know various uh, conveniences from offices and homes so um, great to have all of you here and i'm glad there's such a community of uh, you know young people that uh, want to work in uh, in the waste management uh, field so i'm happy to be speaking today and uh, what i want to speak about today is what needs to be done to uh, create a revolution around uh, plastic recycling in India today, right? So uh, I'll begin by uh, telling you about what the challenges are uh, in the plastic recycling uh, value chain in India, and then move on to uh, how we at Banyan are uh, addressing the problem, right? So I will uh, share my screen. Um, so, um, essentially, uh, if you, um, you know, if, if you've been to India, uh, you know, or, or you've read about waste management in India or seen any of the myriads of documentaries that have been made on waste management in India, you'll know that, you know, we have, uh, an under, in the underbelly of our, uh, you know, big cities, uh, we have uh, a vast network of informal recyclers um, that, uh, that help us recover about 70% of our waste plastics. Now, when I say that, most people, uh, you know, find that unbelievable, right? Uh, can you guys all see my screen now? Yeah, I'm open. Yes, Rashmi, we can. Okay, great. Um, so, um, and, and, you know, people are surprised by that 70% number because uh, the, you know, the world seems to think that um, India doesn't recycle. We do recycle and uh, basically we recover about 70% of our uh, waste plastics. And when you put that into perspective, uh, uh, you know, what in Europe and in America, this is closer to 30 or maybe, uh, you know, in best cases, 40% uh, recovery of recyclable plastics, right? Um, now, the reason we're able to recover a lot of our uh, plastics uh, is because of the informal sector that rely on these plastics uh, for their livelihoods, right? And, and not only is, are they recovering those plastics, but they're recovering it at a very low cost uh, to the environment. So if you think about how recycling is done, um, in developed countries, you have, uh, you know, companies like Waste Management Inc. or Veolia or Suez uh, that send around huge uh, trucks in which waste is hauled from your doorstep. Uh, we don't have that in India. We usually just have, um, you know, uh, our, uh, I'll explain you the value chain, but, um, you know, we usually have just people on their feet or on tricycles coming around to collect our waste from our households. Um, you know, so it, it is, uh, it, it doesn't burn any fuel and it, it is one of the most resource efficient uh, systems for collecting waste. So, so where are we losing the plot um, then? You know, what's the problem you say if, if we're recovering 70% of our waste plastics? Um, really, uh, the challenge is in the fragmented supply chain. Uh, so while that supply chain is the strength of our country, it's also 
uh, sort of working to its detriment as well. Um, so the way uh, recycling works in India is uh, you have itinerant, itinerant collectors like uh, rag pickers or, uh, you know, we have a lot of servant maids or, um, you know, security guards or, uh, you know, just facilities uh, management personnel. Uh, that will recover all of the valuable recyclables from our waste. Um, these then go on to sell to uh, what in the local language are called kabariwalas. You can think of them as stationary sort of aggregators of these supplies. And they they provide a huge service to all the rag pickers and the itinerant collectors, right? Because they're providing a market for all the recyclables. Um, post that, they go to sort of slightly bigger traders uh, who then sort of, you know, aggregate the different materials and separate them by type. So, you know, they may uh, put, let's say, all the, uh, you know, brown cardboard together. They may put all the plastics together and then the transparent plastics together and the colored plastics together and so on. Right. And then from then on, it goes to uh what is a small scale recycler right so to the very right of your screen um, you'll see uh, you know one of maybe 500 or so small scale recycling units that are running uh in hyderabad now i have all respect for the work that they do but uh sometimes they uh you know they they basically uh put both the environment and their own health at risk when they're running such informal operations because uh, plastic is uh, you know very uh, very complex uh, uh, polymer and you know has to be recycled in a scientific way and and when you mix different resins or when you uh, sort of uh, recycle plastic uh, that is contaminated with let's say lead or mercury or has uh, you know chlorides in it or bromides in it, uh, you know, you're you're essentially putting yourself at risk uh, because you're inhaling all those gases that are released, uh, and you're also putting the environment at risk uh, because if you've used water to clean those plastics and you're discharging them in the ground or not um, sort of capturing all the emissions from your operations, uh, then you're you know the, you end up creating a lot more pollution, and basically that's the problem. Uh, that we are sort of looking to solve is, uh, you know, to uh, understand how we can, uh, you know, on one end work to sort of aggregate a lot of these people and on the other end uh, bring in technology that helps uh, create a much more valuable uh, version of that plastic at the other end, right? And it'll only be valuable when it's contamination free and uh, when it when it has uh, high value high value applications in mainstream products so what happens today after the uh, sort of small scale recyclers are done is that most of this plastic is uh, relegated to informal uh, applications uh, and uh, which are like toys and articles that are made of contaminated uh, plastics um, one of the other challenges is the lack of market intelligence. So the photo that you see there is of a typical plastic uh, segregation operation where uh, uh, so, you know segregators and sorters sit and segregate plastics by what is known to them. So they'll bend and bite and burn uh, to segregate plastics. Uh, but the challenge is, uh, while that method works to a certain degree, um, you know it does end up creating a lot of resin pollution. Um, so you have, uh, you know, sometimes PVC will get mixed with PET and, you know, that's not very, uh, very good. Or you'll have, uh, you know, HDP and uh, polypropylene uh, mixed as well, right? So uh, the moment we mix, uh, uh, you know, resins, uh, we're, uh, we're already creating huge problems on the recycling end because, um, you know, all the resins have different melting points. Uh, and some of them even release uh, contaminants uh, like chlorides and bromides and um, you know phthalates and things like that. So it's uh, it's very hazardous when you don't have the the right intelligence to segregate plastics. Um, and the other sort of challenge, as I mentioned, is the lack of uh, you know a proper recycling uh, technology, right? So uh, knowing uh, what is the right way to sort of um, uh, 
you know, segregate and then clean the plastics and rid it of all the contamination. So as a result, what happens uh, in our country is even though we have a 70% recovery rate for plastics, uh, we don't have uh, basically adoption by mainstream products uh, for, uh, uh, for uh, you know, whether it's their products or their packaging, right? So the examples we have here are, you know, personal care and home care products or uh, auto segments. Uh, so these are just the industries that we've sort of uncovered with our work that we're doing in the country. Uh, but there could be so many other applications for uh, recycled plastics that have not been uncovered. And you, you almost never in India find uh, mainstream brands claiming that they have recycled content either in their products or their packaging, because it's largely associated with, um, you know, uh, that either like really uh, faulty supply chains or, you know, that they're in some way inferior in quality and things like that. Um, so that's that's basically uh, uh, you know the challenge that we're looking to solve uh, as Bani Nation. Uh, we're about a, a you know six year old company, and uh, so how are we really solving this problem? Uh, like I said, there are two uh, problems that we're solving. One is integrating the supply chain for uh, plastics, uh, re the recovery of plastics, and on the other end, we have um, you know plastics processing technology. Uh, that we're solving for. Um, so in terms of integrating, uh, it's important that, um, uh, you know, we get all the uh, market intelligence on uh, how the plastics are flowing through the system, whether it's ocean bound plastics or, uh, you know, plastics flowing through our cities or plastics being handled by the informal sector. Uh, and on the other hand, we're working with plastic processing uh, technology uh, such as, uh, uh, you know, uh, how, so, so for example, in the auto sector, the biggest challenge is how do you remove paint from an auto bumper, right? So if you think about a bumper, it's the most discarded plastic component in a car because uh, uh, each car will in its lifetime go through at least two or three bumper changes. Um, uh, and it's, it's meant as a protective uh, component and it's the first one to be damaged. So uh, what, how do we, the biggest challenge with recycling bumper, auto bumpers is the paint that is on it. So our, we uh, invested in you know, research and development to develop a technology to remove that paint uh, such that the base polymer or the virgin polymer can be recycled and returned to uh, form new auto components. Um, similarly, we did, uh, we invested in um, sort of R&D for um, you know, all the contaminants that are proved challenging for FMCG packaging, uh, right? So this is personal care products, home care products, uh, fabric care products, and things like that. Um, and then uh, we also need to think about that our plastic recycling process itself should be the most resource and uh, energy efficient. So for example, um, if you, uh, plastic recycling uses a lot of water, uh, so it's it's essential that those uh, that those of us that recycle uh, also keep in mind that we must recycle our water, our solvents, um, and everything uh, that is involved, uh, so that we're not actually polluting the environment or uh, you know creating a bigger footprint with the resources that we extract in the process as well. Um, so uh, to, to put that into sort of, uh, you know, case studies, uh, we uh, st started our first sort of uh, foray to FMCG packaging with uh, L'Oreal, which is a global brand that makes uh, personal care products. And uh, basically using our, uh, you know, um, recycled plastics, they were able to introduce uh, recycled content uh, in various brands of their uh, packaging, right? And uh, the, the challenge that we've solved, uh, for those of you uh, in the audience that are chemical engineers or are polymer scientists, uh, you will appreciate is that, you know, uh, there, are, there are various ways in which plastics can be manipulated to form packaging or objects and blow molding is one such technology. And it's also the most sensitive of the plastic, uh, um, you know, uh, manipulating technologies, which means that uh, even if there's, you know, slight bit of contamination, 
uh, uh, the bottle will not form because it's literally like you put um, you know polymer in a cavity and you blow air through it to form a bottle uh, right so uh, you can imagine that if you're blowing the balloon and if there's a little bit of a, uh, you know contamination in the uh, in the surface uh, the balloon will uh, burst right so you will either get blow holes or you will get serrations on the surface but uh, but our plastic uh, the technology that we've developed is clean to such a high degree that none of those problems exist and we're able to um, use this plastic in, in packaging, right? Um, the other challenge that we solved, of course, like I spoke about, was removing paint from bumpers. So Tata Motors, which is an Indian automotive company, has been able to introduce, uh, you know, plastic recycled plastics in um, their automotive bumpers as a result of uh, our process. Um, so again, to reiterate the basic capability that uh, that is needed uh, on one end and that we bring is to be is to be able to remove all of the contaminants from plastics uh, and also be able to recover uh, you know water and solvents uh, uh, from the process so that you know you don't end up uh, creating a bigger impact on the environment by recycling uh, than by not recycling right um, so that's something that we have um, invested in and uh, strive to do better in each iteration of our work uh, every day. And on the other end, uh, you know, we work with thousands of, um, you know, informal uh, uh, sector uh, uh, sort of uh, aggregators of plastic. Uh, so what you see on the very left of the screen uh, is a map of uh, Hyderabad, the city we're in right now. And each dot on the map represents uh, one kabadiwala or one stationary recycler. And among them, uh, we sort of categorize them by, um, you know, the, uh, the quality of supplies uh, that they bring to our doorstep. Uh, and we basically, uh, you know, work with them to assess what quality of goods uh, they're bringing, uh, what, how, how much quantity they're trading with us, um, you know, and uh, and over time train them so that they can earn better uh, uh, better prices for the plastics that they recover as well. So just to uh, you know give you an example, a typical sort of recycle uh, you know collector or uh, segregator of plastics in India uh, would make uh, fourteen to fifteen to a maximum of eighteen rupees for mixed plastics that they sell in the market. Uh, but we train them to give us uh, the materials that we recycle in the form that we want it uh, in um, and uh, basically we're able to pay them you know up to 40 40 rupees 45 rupees which is you know three times sometimes um, than what they can earn uh, by just selling mixed plastics that they recover um, so this is uh, really something that's um, you know uh, helping uh, the the supply chain as well and uh, you know, one thing is that, um, you know, since we're a company that works with mainstream brands such as, uh, uh, you know, Unilever and Reckitt Benkaiser and L'Oreal and, um, you know, Shell and Castron and all of these mainstream brands uh, are engaging with us now to use our recycled plastics. Um, they're, they're also now parts of formal supply chains and, not, and are not relegated to just being an informal uh, waste recycler uh, anymore, uh, right? So, um, and uh, we also work with cities. The uh, the map that you see in the middle is a map of a city that's about 200 kilometers uh, from where I sit in Hyderabad, and this is a, a this is a medium sized city in our country, and uh, basically we help the city build a platform to track all of their waste management uh, assets like. Uh, uh, the tricycles and the trucks and um, um, and uh, also their people like um, you know in India the biggest sort of predictor of how clean a uh, a given um, city is uh, is you know basically how many waste workers show up every day to work so we help them track metrics on that we help them track um, you know waste collection metrics and so on and that really sort of help them improve. Uh, their waste management uh, metrics by you know some in some cases in some metrics improved over 60% uh, over a course of six months. 
And um, we also worked um, with uh, Dell that are uh, that wanted to understand the impact of uh, you know plastics that enter the oceans through um, you know uh, through rivers and uh, tributaries and uh, feeder bodies. And so we um, you know helped them sort of understand um, the the interplay of uh, the plastic hotspots uh, in a city like Chennai, that's a coastal city in India, um, uh, along with where, how, what role the uh, you know informal sector or these uh, kabadi wallas that I spoke about uh, play in recovering those ocean-bound plastics as well. So um, it, you know basically uh, we rely heavily on our uh, data intelligence, our uh, understanding our supply chains. Um, to collect all of the plastic that we collect um, and on the other end the technology that we have to sort of clean uh, that plastic to its uh, best possible form such that it can be used in mainstream products and packaging. So um, given uh, that work and basically uh, you know that that's that's essentially what we think is needed to create a plastic revolution, plastic recycling revolution in India. Uh, because um, it, it's similar to uh, a milk revolution that happened in our country, uh, you know, in the 70s and the, uh, you know, earlier part of 80s. Because uh, if you study the history of, uh, you know, milk production in India, uh, you know, we used to be a milk deficit country uh, because largely the, uh, you know, the way milk is farmed in India is through small farmers that own uh, you know, one or two or three or 10 cows, right? Uh, it's not done in sort of industrial scale milk production farms uh, the way it's done um, in, in Europe and, Amer uh, and America. Uh, so, uh, but we, we, so today, if you look at you know, milk production in India, we've still, we still have all of those small milk farmers, uh, but we, we form them into these cooperatives by organizing them and um, and on the other end we've uh, got technology to now pasteurize and homogenize and uh, you know normalize the quantity uh, the quality of milk right and that essentially led India to become a, now a milk surplus country and we actually are one of the largest exporters of milk and milk products right and so uh, that's essentially the intervention that we seek to as a company create in the plastic recycling value chain in india is that we want to rely on the informal sector we don't want to uproot them or replace them in any way we want to organize them better we want to train them better uh, we want to uh, basically harness all of the good that they bring to our country in terms of recovering 70% of our plastics uh, from you know, going to landfills and oceans. And on the other end, use the, uh, our innovative, uh, our proprietary technology that we've developed to clean that plastic such that we can channel it back into circular economy applications. And um, so we've won a few awards uh, for the work we've done, including uh, the Circular Economy um, Award at the Circulars at uh, the World Economic Forum in uh, 2018. We've uh, won awards from the Indian government, um, and you know we've been recognized by the Rockefeller Foundation City Exchange as one of the promising waste management uh, solutions. Um, so um, and. Based on and it's 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 largely been possible because of the team uh, we have here. Uh, the co-founders of the company are uh, yeah, Mani and Raj, who uh, you know come from Silicon Valley experiences and uh, brought some of their technology, uh, passion for technology and technology expertise into waste management. Uh, we rely heavily on Venkat, who is a part of our supply chain team and brings tremendous amount of uh, knowledge of the informal sector from working in microfinance in India. And he has essentially been the reason why we have such a strong supply chain of uh, informal uh, you know, suppliers in India. Uh, we have Baskar who basically uh, brings in the so uh, you know, software engineering uh, expertise to build our data systems. And I basically help the team uh, with uh, you know business development uh, 
to uh, so that we liaison with all the mainstream brands and products uh, to complete the uh, circular economy uh, mission that we set out to do. Um, so uh, that's it. That's all about Pan Indian Nation and uh, what we think it takes to uh, you know sort of revolutionize uh, plastic uh, recycling in India. Uh, so uh, I am happy to now take any questions. From you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Rashi. That's that's an incredible presentation, and congratulations. You're leading the circular economy rec revolution in India. I would say we've got a lot of questions for you, of course, uh, but I would cho randomly choose a couple of questions and post them to you. Uh, the first one is from Vekesa. How is the cost distributed in a in a way such that the cost of recycled plastic is competitive as opposed to virgin plastic? Right, and that right off the bat is a very difficult question, but a, a great question to ask. Um, so, uh, I, I'm sure uh, all of you know that you know the virgin plastic prices are volatile, right? So they are entirely sort of uh, pegged to petroleum prices. So, uh, you know, uh, something happens in the Middle East or America, and the prices tank, or you know, something uh, or whatever. So, you know, these are entirely, uh, you know, economic and uh, uh, sort of geopolitical cycles that dictate the virgin plastic prices. Now, that's not quite the same for, uh, you know, uh, recycled plastics, right? Because the, this, is, this is something that is uh, completely uh, reliant on the informal sector uh, that essentially sort of puts the price of labor to that plastics, right? So these are, uh, so they, it's a product that has already had its value once and we're creating a value for it uh, a second time or a third time around, right? Um, so now uh, these are, so we try not to compare the price of virgin and uh, recycled plastics. That said, unless it is competitive, people will not use recycled plastics, right? So, um, it, we the way we convince brands to look at pricing is that in the long term um the uh, recycled plastics will always be cheaper than virgin plastics however in short term cycles like if you if you spoke to me last year this time virgin uh, uh, virgin uh, the recycled plastic was significantly cheaper than virgin but if you talk to me today they're at the same cost right so, uh, so it really depends on where the uh, virgin pl pl uh, plastic prices are, uh, whereas recycling pl uh, uh, prices remain consistently the same. And in fact, a lot of companies see that as a hedge uh, because you know it, it tends to normalize their uh, their cost of production as well, right? So you have a resource uh, on one end that is highly volatile and, and you know reliant on global cycles whereas you have another uh, that is less so right so if if you have a percentage of both then you're sort of hedging uh, your pricing uh, for whether it's your product or your packaging as well so great question thank you thanks thanks a lot the next question is from Karthik from Munich mm -hmm. uh, his question is is EPR framework used by you to fund recycling for bigger chains so are you using the EPR policies and these kind of initiatives? Um, yeah, so uh, I, I, I definitely think that the EPR policy is a, a step in the right direction for countries like India. Uh, however, uh, a lot needs to be done in ways of implementation of such policies. Right, so uh, we're, we're fairly new to EPR laws and things like that. Uh, and uh, what, what that means is there's a lot of uncertainty about the implementation of the laws. So um, each uh, company is interpreting the EPI laws in their own ways, um, right? So, um, and uh, honestly, we as a company want to do this work regardless of whether that framework exists or not, right? Because essentially, if there's a market for recycled plastics, it should exist independent of whether there are subsidies uh, offered or um, you know uh, basically 
you know, incentives offered by the government or by brands, right? That said, uh, what things like EPR laws do is that they force brands to take ownership of the waste that they put out. And which helps companies like us to sort of drill in the message of, uh, uh, you know, circular economy with these brands. So I definitely think it helps. Uh, I definitely think there's a long way to go in terms of really implementing implementing EPR frameworks and EPR laws. Uh, but uh, yes, it's definitely a step in the right direction. It def it helps companies like us uh, sort of channel our message better. Great. Thank you. The next question is from Shivali. Uh, so the question is basically in India, there's a lot of manual sorting of plastic that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, do you find it a problem to procure specific qualities and quantities? And do you think mechanical sorting would enable recyclers like you uh, recycle better? Uh, yes, I mean, uh, so I think, uh, like I said, we, uh, we don't want to take away from the work that this informal sector is doing, right? So uh, there, there are literally millions of people in our country that rely on this trade uh, for their livelihoods. So I, we don't want to take away this uh, from them uh, tomorrow, right? So how can we then solve the problem without sort of hurting uh, that demographic? So we basically, what we've done is we've we engaged in a, a lot of training of these uh, uh, informal suppliers, right? So, for example, we collect a lot of low grade HDPE material, right? And uh, we've trained them to sort of recognize the triangle with the two uh, that is at the bottom of uh, most of the uh, bottles, right? So, two is the universal symbol for uh, HDPE plastics. And slowly over time, they have everybody can read two, right? Even with even the lowest literacy people can read it too. Um, so they read the twos at the bottoms of the bottles and they collect all of those number two bottles for us, uh, you know, separately from all other plastics. Now, what does that do? They would have sold mixed plastics again for 15 rupees, but they sell it to us for 45 rupees or so. That's only number twos at the bottom, uh, right? So in that way, we're enabling them to already do 80% of the work that needs to be done uh, in the uh, in the supply chain, uh, right? And and basically, so of course, it's still you know it's not a foolproof system. It still has some uh, uh, you know some uh, polypropylene bottles or some, um, and you'll always have the bottles will have gaps and closures that are not uh, high density polyethylene. Um, so we do have a system at our end right, to separate all of those contaminations as well. Right, but but I still want our supply chain to be doing most of the segregation work, so that we're only doing the last sort of uh, fifteen to twenty percent of the segregation on our end. Because if you think about it, if I'm transporting mixed plastics, it it also makes better business sense, right? Because if I'm transporting a lot of mixed plastics and then throwing about fifty percent, sixty percent of it, or having to transport the rest of it back, uh, then now I've spent all this carbon transporting stuff that I don't want, right? So we want all of that to be done at the last mile and only bring in what we're recycling to our plant. Perfect. That's that's great. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, just to conclude, I mean, we don't have more time for questions, but I'm sure a lot of people want to ask. But just to conclude, we would, would you like to suggest so because you're working so closely with the informal sector and with the big recyclers what is the biggest challenge you face in integrating the two uh, maybe you can tell us what's the biggest challenge and how do you overcome it the biggest challenge still uh, and also the opportunity is scaling uh, this right so we now have orders for thousands of tons uh, per year of recycled plastic. So what keeps my team going every day and night is how are we going to procure that uh, plastic from the informal sector, right? Because the people that we're talking about can process, um, you know, 100 kgs, 200 kgs, uh, one ton per week. And we're talking now about thousands of these guys, right? So how do we sort of uh, work in a systematic way 
such that we get a steady, predictable um, stream of material at our factory, right? And uh, that's both a challenge and an opportunity uh, for us, right? So we build sort of the back end uh, data intelligence behind it. We build uh, uh, through our software team. We have a field team of about, um, you know, uh, now 50 people that are in 20 cities in India uh, that are that, that only sort of live to, um, you know, make sure that we have consistent uh, quality and quality is landed at our doorstep to service all of our uh, sort of, uh, um, you know, um, contacts. So I think that small picture begins sort of. Like I said, challenge and opportunity here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rashi. Uh, and to all the participants, uh, we have come to the end of our keynote session. Uh, it was a wonderful presentation and a lot of learning for all of us. And I'm sure everybody would agree with me. Uh, thank you very much again. Uh, we will now head on to the presentations. But before before that, we before that, uh, I'd like to introduce you to Shivali. Shivali will be the moderator for the sessions from now on. Uh, I think uh, Shivali, uh, please take over the mic. For me. Thank you. Thank you, Vishwas. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Shivali Sugant and supporting ISFA YPG research team since last two years. I'm working as a guest researcher at Leibniz University, Hanover. And I also handle the business development from a waste engineering firm here. It's called UE GmbH. Uh, I have over five years of experience in waste management, circular economy domain, both in India and Germany. And uh, my expertise lies in decentralized municipal waste treatment technologies and capacity building and training. I warmly welcome you all to today's online conference. So before we start, I would uh, like to remind uh, that there's for our uh, for our audience, there is a QA and a session in the end of presentations. So please submit your text questions for each presenter by typing your question into the attendee interface that you see. That you see, and please mention your name and state to which presenter you want to forward your question. Uh, now, without a further ado, I would like to welcome our first presenter, Ms. Sania Rafiq from Pakistan, who is presenting the title. Removal of textile dye using electro coagulation. Sanya is a recent graduate. She's done her bachelor's in environmental engineering. She has received many awards and has worked in over 20 projects during her bachelor's. Sanya, your floor is yours. Please go ahead. Uh, Sanya, please unmute yourself. <laughs> Okay. Uh, thank you, Vice Team, for the invitation. Today, I'm here to discuss the most important uh, aspects, which is the waste management practices. Coming towards the problem statements. Environmental degradation, a low declining economy, chronic diseases, a shorter life expectancy than our parents. This is the real world we pass on to our future. Uh, wastewater contamination is one of the biggest challenge in Pakistan, not only in Pakistan, but also worldwide. Wastewater contamination, one of the biggest con uh, contamination wastewater is the textile industry because these industries emitted, uh, uh, use, uh, utilize 20 billion pounds chemicals annually. The chemicals which generated from these industries are not discharge according to the legislation and cause water pollution worldwide. Among the current pollution control technologies, the degradation of synthetic dyes by using electric current is one of the emerging as an affecting and promising approach. 
the main objective behind this presentation obviously first of all to protect the public health to make the water that is aesthetically desirable to reuse the water for car washing industrial use fire fighting ground water recharge purposes and to and to reduce the water footprint on the ground to by implementing a waste waste management technology to strengthen this project we review different literature including what are the dyes and their impacts in textile industries mostly industries utilize reactive dyes and also dyes because of their color fastness ease of application ease of application uh, we also discuss conventional treatment technologies and why they are not useful for the removal of these dyes modern te treatment technology like electrocoagulation and its comparison with other technologies its system capability its feasibility its application and at the end but not the least pros and cons of electrocoagulation for the past few decades the in textile waste water the dyes majorly dyes and other pollutant have become an area of interest for environmental research because of their potential impact not only on humans but also ground on aquatic life textile dyes these dyes percolate through the ground layer and pose a threat to the human life these dyes if the workers if the workers are working in uh, are involved in such activities which involve the application of these dyes they may have the allergic reactions to their eyes skin irritation irritation to mucous membrane these dyes are basically toxic non biodegradable compound heavy metals made up of heavy metals these are carcinogenic and cause cancer of kidney urinary bladder and liver these dyes enter the body by ingestion and are metabolized by intestinal microorganism causing dna damage coming towards the main idea behind this research which is the electrocoagulation electrocoagulation is basically the process of destabilizing suspending emulsified or dissolved contaminant in an aqueous medium by passing electric current basically we in in our experiment we used two electrodes one is made up of aluminium and other is made up of iron these two iron these two electrodes are connected to a dc power supply uh, the uh, uh, oxidation of aluminium occur at the anode and reduction of cathode occur at uh, uh, iron occur at cathode due to these reactions aluminium hydroxides are formed which act as a coagulant and uh, and make the dye species to form uh, to form a flux the in these reactions hydrogen oxide hydrogen gas is produced which act, uh, which helps in the formation of the flux i would like to focus you on this picture this is this is the basic result of the experiment you can see a less sludge is produced on the upper layer and we used in our ex we used methyl orange and methyl blue in our experiment we not only used these synthetic dyes but also used textile waste water and the result was just incredible the removal of heavy metals vod cod and suspended solid and total dissolved solid can also be removed by this experiments obviously the this technology is the basic need of the future because it's it's a low cost easy handling and as per production sludge production technology not um, and electrocoagulation can also treat leather and tanning industry paper and pulp industry arsenic fluoride containing waste water metal bearing industrial waste water oil mill waste water that's why this the that's is the basic need of the future conclusion in short i can say that electrocoagulation is successfully been applied for the removal of specific problematic factors like color which cannot be easily removed by conventional treatment technologies like uh, biodegradation and adsorption which are time consuming methods electro uh, simple coagulation methods which utilized many chemicals for the degradation of these dyes these dyes cannot be degraded by bacteria so biological treatment are also not useful for the removal of these dyes allogically however the allogically systematic approach to a fundal and understanding of electrocoagulation is apparently missing and thus needs further new dedicated effort it is apparent that this emerging technology will continue to make inroads into the waste water treatment arena because of its numerous advantages and changing strategic global water needs
Thank you so much. That's all. Thank you, Sania. Uh, thank you for this insightful presentation. Uh, as a reminder, I would like to tell you all, you can still post your questions through the question pane in your attendee control panel, and presenters will answer them during the Q&A session. So without further delay, I would now welcome our, uh, our next presenter, which is Annie Philip from India. Uh, and his presentation title is Waste, Yes, in My Backyard. Annie is a lawyer working in waste sector in India, uh, leads compliance and regulatory policy at SAVAS, and she has been involved in drafting solid waste frameworks in Karnataka. Annie, the floor is yours now. Thanks, Shafali. Shivali. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my presentation today is going to be on how decentralized waste management systems can be a viable strategy to manage waste uh, in developing countries, which also results in a maximum recovery of resources. Um, what I am presenting in this uh, presentation today um, involves uh, results from our projects across 21 locations in India and also other decentralized waste management systems that have been implemented in India. Um, waste is one of the uh, fastest growing crises in the developing world um, due to increased urbanization, uh, growing population and fast consumerism. India today generates 62 million tons of waste every year and more than 80% of them gets dumped in landfills and dump sites. Um, with the growing population pressure on land, uh, there's a realization that landfills is not really a viable solution. And therefore, looking at the West, there is this increasing leaning towards waste to energy technologies. And therefore, if you look at this presentation, you will see um, essentially what's been happening and what is considered as a proposed solution. Um, so essentially, what used to happen is unsegregated waste used to be collected and dumped in landfills. So the current solution is more or less the same. It's the same linear disposal system where landfills is now sought to be replaced by waste to energy plants. However, in the last few years, we've seen several waste to energy plants failing, and there are several reasons for it, but they can be kind of put into three buckets. Uh, the first bucket is the fact that the waste in India is unsuitable for incineration. Uh, one reason being that there is a large organic content in Indian waste, more than 40 to between 40 to 60% of the waste tends to be organic, which leads to a lower calorific value as compared to the waste in the West. Um, secondly, due to minimal segregation of waste at source, the waste that used to land up in the waste to energy plant also had a low calorific value. Um, therefore, you had a situation where the input for the plant was actually unsuitable. The second main bucket of reasons is costs. Now, not only the capital cost for setting up waste to energy plants was really high, but also the operational cost was really expensive as well. Um, one I reason towards... Just, just a second. Could you please yeah. share your screen? Uh, because oh. we cannot see your screen and sorry just one second huh? uh, just there is a share button on the left yeah sorry no worries is that okay now uh i still cannot see your screen mm, one second is that fine now yeah now it's perfect Okay, so sorry, do you also want me to just go back on my presentation or can I just move ahead with uh, what I was saying? I think you can go ahead, it's, it's okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so what I was saying is um, the fact that waste to energy, the reasons for why waste to energy plants have actually uh, failed is you have a situation where um, the co operational costs are high. And the reason is that the waste, because it's unsuitable for what's been uh, received at the plant, you actually need to put more energy into the waste to actually make it suitable for uh, incineration and generation of electricity. Uh, the other reason is these plants tend to be highly polluting. Therefore, there's a lots of cost involved in actually putting in pollution control measures. And therefore, all these reasons, you have a uh, situation where the cost of power from waste to energy plants is far higher than thermal, conventional thermal plants, which just makes waste to energy plants unviable as compared to thermal plants. And finally, a critical reason is the fact that there are environmental and health concerns associated with waste to energy plants in India. 
uh, because mixed waste is being burnt, there is a significant emission of dioxins and furnace, which leads to severe air pollution. Um, similarly, unsuitable waste is actually dumped around the waste to energy plant, which also leads to soil and water pollution and therefore leading to increased public outrage against these plants. And therefore, these are the main reasons why waste to energy plants have kind of failed in India so far. And uh, due to these reasons, there has been an increasing sort of realization that we need to find a solution which is more contextual and more local to Indian needs. And that's where decentralized waste management systems have come in. And if you can look at the slide, uh, this essentially gives an overview of what decentralized waste management systems are and what is it that we, have, we and others have implemented across the country. Um, so the first step is to ensure that the waste is segregated at source. Uh, and this source could be a, a, a community, it could be a large waste generator such as an educational institution or a technology park which at one source generates a lot of waste. Um, once you have segregated waste at this source, um, like I had mentioned that more than 40 to 60 percent of the total waste tends to be organic. So the idea is to treat the organic waste on site to the extent possible. So this could be either through compost or biogas. Um, if the premise does not have place, the, the solution is to take the organic waste to the closest community organic waste management center where it's turned into com compost or biogas. So the only real waste which is kind of left over to be transported is the non-biodegradable waste, which gets transported to the closest aggregation center. And this is where the waste gets sorted into different categories, where the recycled fraction of the uh, non-biodegradable waste gets sent to recycling plants, where it gets recycled into new products. And this is where we are looking at closing the loop and circular economy, while the non-recyclable fraction actually goes to cement plants uh, for co-processing along with fossil fuels. Uh, sending non-recyclable waste to cement plants is a viable option in India because uh, India has the second largest cement industry in the world and therefore you have a situation where there's a ready-made destination for non-recyclable waste. Uh, the next few slides are essentially photographs of these solutions that have been implemented across the country by us. Uh, the first slide uh, in this regard talks about management of biodegradable waste. Uh, where the first set of pictures are of community facilities where the waste from communities get treated at community uh, organic waste management facilities. The second set of photos are actually of on-site facilities. So this is a waste management unit in a technology park which generates more than two tons of waste every day. So they have a compost unit where the organic waste is uh, treated while the non-biodegradable uh, waste is actually transported out of the uh, technology park. And to the extent there is no place available with the uh, generator, it goes to the organic waste goes to decentralized biogas plants for uh, biomethanation. Um, these set of photos essentially show what happens to the non biodegradable waste, uh, where the waste is first aggregated at a materials recovery facility, then gets sorted into 14 to 16 categories on the conveyor belt, um, then it gets baled, and the re recycled fraction goes to the recycling factories, while the non recyclable portion goes to cement plants for co-processing. Um, this slide essentially shows you the different kind of recycled products and how closing of the loop can happen with several fractions of waste. Uh, the t-shirts that you see on the top left corner are actually made of, each t-shirt is made of 12 PET bottles. Um, so therefore you have um, PET being recycled into yarn and then made into garments. Of course, paper gets uh, recycled into other stationary products. Uh, the one you see on the left bottom corner is actually discarded Tetra Pak, which is turned into a board and roofing sheets, which can be used as a replacement for conventional plywood and roofing sheets. And of course, uh, discarded fabric and textiles can be upcycled into other products as well. So um, coming to what has been the impact of decentralized waste management uh, systems that we have implemented across uh, different locations. The first impact is social impact. There is a generation of livelihood. And that livelihood we have looked at is 250 permanent jobs. This is more than 250 permanent jobs with 60% uh, uh, with 60 of these jobs being taken by women from base of the pyramid. Um, the next major impact that we have seen is environmental. Uh, we've managed to divert 18 tons of waste from landfills every day. And finally, the recovery of resources here has been uh, phenomenal, where we have, we have seen more than 85% of waste which has actually been recovered as resources. 
So the impact of decentralized waste management systems is not only environmental, but also social. And just to conclude, um, based on our experience with decentralized waste management systems in India, we believe that these systems can work in other low and middle income countries as well. And the main reasons for it is kind of set out below, uh, where we believe that the waste characteristics across developing countries that we have looked at in South America, Africa, and Asia, the waste characteristics are similar, where an organic fraction of the waste constitutes more than 40 to 60 percent, which is similar to India. And therefore, composting in biogas on a decentralized manner can actually be a viable solution. Uh, the overall costs are cheaper, the transportation cost is cheaper, and uh, and that is because the amount of waste that needs to be transported is less because of on-site organic waste management and the distances um, on which the, the non-biodegradables have to be, be transported are lesser. Uh, the decentralized systems tend to be smaller, less mechanized, um, uh, have uh, lower pollution control measures to be taken, and therefore the overall operational cost of decentralized systems is less. Um, and uh, the next big advantage is, of course, better resource recovery. And this we have seen in our own experience. When waste was being sent to a centralized facility, the resource recovery was approximately around 30%. But once we implemented decentralized waste management systems, the yeah. resource recovery went up because yeah just almost one minute more yeah yeah one, one minute more Shifan. uh and the All resource right. recovery went up to uh almost 90 to 95 percent so there's better resource recovery um overall lesser concentration of pollutants in the waste management unit and therefore more ownership by the neighborhood uh, uh, around the waste management plant and finally and most critically uh, it is a source of livelihood and this is critical in developing countries which has a large informal sector which works in dangerous and unsafe conditions and therefore decentralized waste management systems can actually be a source of livelihood where could they where they could be employed um, in, and be given safe and dignified livelihoods and for all of these reasons we believe that decentralized waste management is not only a waste management solution but also a solution which creates social impact and environmental impact across developing country and that's it thank you so much Thank you, Annie. Thank you so much for your presentation. Now I would like to welcome our next presenter, uh, T.S. Krishnan from India, whose presentation title would be Understanding India's E-Waste Reverse Supply Chain. Uh, T.S. Krishnan is a manager at Emphasis Next Labs. He's a PhD in operations and supply chain from IIM Bangalore. He's an expert on e-waste supply chain. He has professional experience in domains like enterprise software, retail analytics, commodity derivatives, and machine learning. T.S. Krishnan, uh, I would request you to kindly start your presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Shivali. Sorry. Thank you, Shivali. So is my, is, am I audible? Is my screen visible? Is that fine? Yeah. Yeah. Your screen okay. is fine. Yeah. And I hope my audio is also fine. Thank you very much. So the topic of my presentation today is my doctoral dissertation, which is to understand India's e-waste reverse supply chain. Now, by reverse supply chain, is very in concept. It is similar to the concept of a value chain, which uh, Rashi had explained in the keynote. By what do we mean by a rever a re reverse supply chain or a value chain? Is once consumers like you and me and these big bulk generators discard e-waste, where does it go to? Who takes care of it? From there, how does it flow to the system? That is the concept of a reverse supply chain or a value chain. And that is what I will be covering in the presentation. In India, in 2011, there was a, the, the government came with a legislation called as e-waste rules 2011 to manage the growing importance of e-waste. And what this legislation said was two things. One is it said manufacturers have to take back from consumers. That is the extended producer responsibility. And it also said that the informal recycling is illegal. If you are informal, it's it, it, you are illegal, and it, only the formal recycling sector is the legal one. So these are the two things that the legislation said. Now, with this context, I'll move ahead with my presentation. Now, I studied two questions as part of my thesis. One is uh, in Bangalore, there was an interesting case of a lot of these informal sector uh, members moving to the part, moving to the formal sector. So I studied their formalization, what challenges they faced during the formalization phase, 
and after they became formal were they still profitable or were, were they still be able to doing a business or not in the second question i studied when e waste is discarded the the entire chain the, how it flows through the system till the point it gets converted into recyclables either it reaches the second hand market or either metals are extracted from it so these are the two key questions which i studied and to answer these questions i i interviewed about uh, roughly about 49 stakeholders throughout the supply chain which includes sources of e waste collectors of e waste e waste recyclers that is the processors the informal sector the formal sector the government officials a few ngos and e and also the the final destinations that is the second hand market participants the precious metal refiners and the scrap metal traders so these are the overall it was like 49 stakeholders and apart from interviewing them i also visited these industry conferences where the formal recycling and the manufacturers who are responsible for product take back they came and they spoke so i was also a participant in these uh, industry conferences so apart from these interviews there were a lot of direct observation informal conversation which i did with the uh, market participants in the value chain or in the reverse supply chain i'm using both these concepts synonymously reverse supply chain and value chain so uh, the the sources of data collection one was interviews one was direct observation informal conversation then uh, documents obtained from respondents and then i also refer the secondary sources like these news databases called factiva lexis nexis times of india archives etc now the the good thing about doing this secondary sources was i could corroborate the evidence which i obtained from the respondents directly now based on all this data that was collected i put all of them into the qualitative software which is the nvivo software which i used for qualitative data analysis and based on this uh, coding and analysis of qualitative data in the software the the so called findings of the study were arrived at now one key thing to highlight here is the, the chain of evidence right from the interviews that is the raw data till the point that the findings were obtained one could easily trace back and forth which helps an external reviewer to see that this this process is traceable and this process is transparent so this is the methodology and the data collection approach which are used for the study next i'll get into the key findings one finding with respect to the formalization of informal e waste processes so one key finding was that now is that this uh, informal to formal was not a success story so proprietor of alpha which is an informal turn formal firm had to tell this you know informal sector is a profitable business in formal sector we are losing money uh like four to five times of what is incurred in the formal sector is incurred to run a firm in the formal in the formal sector now what is the outcome of the study was that the simplistic assumption that formalization would help the informal processes to process more e waste efficiently due to scale economies is falsified and steady predictable supply of adequate quantity of e waste is still elusive for all the informal turned formal processes so all of them resorted to either uh, you know uh, they will be formal on paper but uh, in the real life they would be still doing the informal sector operations so this is one finding with respect to formalization of informal the second finding is related to the structure of the reverse supply chain or the value chain now i'm just illustrating the supply chain with some brands and these brands are used only for illustrative purpose it doesn't mean that i have gone ahead and interviewed them and the image source for this are from the respective websites the sources include these bulk generators like uh, you know if, if the the like education institutions like this uh, product and components manufacturers like atns is a major manufacturer of printed circuit boards and then electronic products manufacturers like hal it also comes through imports and then there are retail consumers like you and me which are the major sources and then you have this next level of collectors which include companies like bin bag which includes ngos and uh, firms like sahas and retailers like coma and manufacturers like dell and then you have a set of recyclers or the processors now when you look at this you can find that all of them are in the formal economy now there is one key difference here so firms like e scrappy e wad new tech 
so these are the firms who are the informal turn formal firms the other firms in this level of processes are purely from the formal sector now in 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 machinery manufacturing there are firms like respos which which manufactures machinery for recycling e waste for example peeling the uh, plastic from the wires come refurbish cannibalization disassembly into commodities into plastic metals glass etc and then metal recovery from printed circuit boards the final destinations are where companies like green dust reboot they operate in the second hand market and then you have companies like videocon and some jewelry firms that take metals from the extracted uh, metals from the printed circuit boards and then there are these precious metal refiners and then these are the scrap metal traders who collect scrap metal which comes like ferrous non ferrous etc from the recyclers and melt them and make them into metal ingots and then you have the incinerators and the scientific waste uh, uh, this, uh, the scientific waste uh, uh, i'm sorry i'm not able to get the right word for it so these are the people who dispose e waste scientifically like ramki and gomti is the uh, firm that incinerates waste That is Please, Krishna, we have strategy. last two minutes left. Okay. Just as a reminder. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay, so e-waste reverse supply chain is characterized by some fundamental forces at work. One is a lot of history is involved. So what you see in the e-waste uh, reverse supply chain is a function of the informal economy, the rich metallurgical history which has been existing for centuries, and the informal economy is also characterized by a lot of tacit knowledge. Which the in which the informal processes has gained by experience, apprenticeship, etc. So the what I'm trying to say is when you talk about the formal formal sector, they operate in terms of scale. The informal sector operates in the form of a scope. And and this is the reason why informal economy is able to persist in the e-waste recycling industry because of their focus on scope. Now when informal sector formalizes and becomes formal. the the scope becomes the scale that is alignment of their operational configuration with the nature of this e waste industry is lost and that is why many of them are not able to survive in the formal sector now what i'm trying to say here is can we re reframe the e waste problem because of this research so we have been trying to find a solution to the e waste problem in terms of epr by looking at 90% of the e waste processed in the informal economy the same problem if we can reframe it and ask questions like what makes the informal processes tick what is the structure of the supply chain we can arrive at a very different kind of solutions like can we facilitate markets to function by setting up recycling parks and can we provide an industry status that is the ministry of commerce can provide the status of an industry to the recycling sector which will help financial institutions to fund this industry so this is the topic of my study and the findings thank you very much for your time thank you thank you ts krishnan uh, yeah. thank you for the presentation and for such a detailed and informative uh, information on the on your thesis as a remind, reminder i would like to um, just remind that uh, you can post your questions in that nd control panel and presenters will answer it in the end in the q and a session so good news ladies and gentlemen now we have come to the final presentation of the session uh as now i would welcome mr mohit somania from india whose presentation title is dump site reclamation feasibility of bulk reuse of aged municipal solid waste mohit is a research scholar at iit delhi as part of his research phd program he is looking after reclamation of municipal waste dump sites in india with an approach of landfill mining welcome mohit now the floor is yours uh, hello and good morning everyone i hope i am audible yes am mohit, i your voice is fine okay 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 i'll share my screen uh, so is it visible to everyone not yet okay Let me try it again. There is a share screen green button on the left. 
Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm trained that way. Yes. Uh, now, is it fine now? Yeah, you just have to come on the presentation mode. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, so uh, today I'm here to present the topic of my ongoing research work on uh, dump sites rehabilitation. So the title will be Dump Sites Reclamation Feasibility of Bulk Reuse of Aged Municipal Solid Waste. So just to introduce okay, the topic, you just to. On the slide show mode? Um, yeah. Is it fine? Slide show mode. You, we can just see the presentations yeah. in the PowerPoint. Yeah. Yeah, I'm in the slideshow mode. Uh, not really. Uh, there is this slideshow button in the bottom. You have to press that. It yeah, yeah. Full screen. No, it's not full yeah, screen right I'm... now. Is it OK now? Um, you have to start. Go on slideshow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm trying that. And on slideshow, start show. Okay. Slideshow. Start. After sharing your screen. Or if you like, we can start your slides and you mm -hmm. can keep speaking and let us know. Is that okay? Oh, wait. No, I just try. Is it okay now? Is it okay uh, now? Uh, no. So go on the slideshow and then from the beginning, press this button. Uh, yeah, from the yeah. beginning. Yeah. Yeah. Is it okay? Yeah. It's okay. I think you can go ahead. Okay. Uh, so just to introduce the topic, uh, this is the scenario of dump sites uh, as on today in India. You can see the pictures uh, captured in pa last couple of years. Uh, uh, these are from various uh, locations or various cities of uh, India. Uh, you can see the problem or nuisance created by dump sites in the, in the form of fire or uh, smell, odor, leachate accumulated near the surface of uh, dump sites. And here are some facts uh, which are very eye-opening. India generates around 60 million tons of garbage every year, out of which around 70 or 80 percent ends up at the dump sites. And by the end of 2013, we'll be generating around 130 million tons of waste per year which will be requiring at least 160,000 acres of land as landfill. So the need of the R is to find the solution to get rid of these dump sites or find a sustainable solution for the waste management of the seat of the country. Now in our study, we are using the, pro, uh, the concept of landfill mining as the solution to get rid of this problem. So we are, what I have done in last two years, I have visited five, six dump sites of the country and collected waste from, uh, say, about the depth of five to six meters from the top of the landfill, and then finally segregated this waste into various fraction and then uh, try to see the reuse of this waste. Uh, and I'm only focused about the fine fraction of the, that waste. So uh, here are the photographs which shows how this process was carried out. Uh, this is how the waste was collected from the landfill with the help of uh, backhoe excavator. And then finally, it is segregated at the site itself uh, based on the Indian standard sieve classification. So we are uh, mainly focused on aged municipal solid waste. Now, just to uh, define what is aged municipal solid waste, it's nothing but the waste which is uh, which was dumped uh, 10 or 20 years before uh, at these dump sites, which has almost degraded and becomes like soil. So here is the uh, uh, beef methodology. And uh, these are the four landfills selected for the present study. So you can see the basic information about these landfills. The most important is to see the quantity of total quantity of waste accumulated at these dump sites. So you can see around five to seven million tons of waste is accumulated or disposed at these dump sites. And these dump sites were in operation from 25 to 30 years ago. So 
Uh, now, my entire study, as I already told, is focused on the material which is less than 4.75 mm. So this 4.75 mm comes from Indian standard. Indian standards define the fraction of uh, total material down 4.75 mm is considered as soil light. And this forms the majority of waste which is accumulated at these dump sites. So we are looking at the feasibility of reuse of this waste. Now, this testing methodology involves in uh, here I am presenting the uh, testing methodology in brief. Now, this soil like material, which is uh, which has been degraded uh, from last 20 years, it can be used in two ways. Either it can be used directly as a soil in in the filling of low lying area or in earth fills or in embankment or it can be used as compost so to but if we are visit, uh, using this material as soil then it has to meet several regulatory standard and what those standards are it has to fulfill the criteria in terms of contamination in terms of its mechanical property mechanical properties are nothing but its strength its permeability compressibility etc and also it should not be biodegradable easily and later on to see its uh, suitability as compost we have compared compared this material with the natural compost or compost standard available with us now to uh, fulfill the compost criteria it is to meet all the nutrients level uh, of the compost now finally to uh, reuse this material as soil we have compared it with the uncontaminated local soil available near the dump sites however to see its feasibility as compost we have compared it with the with the compost that is actually available in the in the compost plants now here is the results section so results section comprised of following three heads i have presented uh, uh, in this presentation i am presenting uh, physical characterization of this material physical characterization in terms of its compositional analysis its grain size distribution comparison with local soil again in terms of its contaminants its organic content that is nothing nothing but biodegradation and its geotechnical suitability or mechanical suitability then to compare it with compost I have presented total organic carbon analysis of this material and nutrients in the form of NPK, that is nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus, and again in terms of heavy metals. So uh, this picture gives uh, the overview of grain size and composition of this aged municipal solid waste. So you can see from this pie chart that around 60 percent, as I already mentioned in the first slide, consists of material down 4 mm. And the composition of the material also shows that bulk of this material uh, seems to be very fine. Can you please also run your slides simultaneously? Yeah. Okay. I'm I'm running. Am I? I think your is screen is. Yeah, we can see your screen, but the slide is stuck at slide number two. Oh, so sorry. No, 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 no. I don't know what's wrong. Can you please share from your uh, your end? Yeah, yeah. Just a second. That's we will do yeah. it. Give me a second. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so you can see Sweta's screen. Which slide number should I go on? OK, uh, you can go to uh, slide number five. Can everyone see this? Yeah, I can see this. Yes, we can. Yes. OK, so uh, as I mentioned, the uh, reuse of this material, which is aged municipal solid waste, are uh, it can be used as soil or it can be directly used as compost. Now, uh, the point to note is I'm only focused on the fine fraction of degraded waste. It, uh, 
as I mentioned that it uh, before re uh, reusing this material as soil, it has to be assessed for its contamination, its mechanical properties, and its biodegradation. However, to use it as compost, it has to be characterized for its nutrient values in terms of nitrogen, phosphorus, and pot potash, and also in terms of heavy metals and total organic carbon. Now, go, go ahead, slide number six. Yeah, so this is the physical classification of this physical analysis of this material in terms of its grain size and in terms of its composition. So the grain size of aged municipal solid waste shows that around 60 to 70 percentage of this material looks as soil like. Whereas composition analysis also shows that around 70 percentage of the material is very f is uh, finer in terms of its size, in terms of its visual classification. Next slide, please. Yeah, so here is the comparison of this material with the locally available soil uh, and which was collected from the nearby area of the dump sites. So from A to B, I think, yeah. Uh, so column number three to column number uh, seven uh, presents the characterization of soil like material that is degraded waste collected from four landfills and on the extreme right side you can see the uh, uh, contaminants proportion in the locally available soil which was uncontaminated so contaminants were assessed on the basis of soluble solids sulfate chlorides chromium nickel and such type of heavy metals so you can see uh, like in the local soil uh, and in the soil like material from aged waste there is significant difference in terms of its contaminants so uh, clearly it can be seen that high degree of contaminant with respect to local soil was observed in the soil like material collected from waste aged waste so this was one aspect second aspect was of biodegradation biodegradation was measured in terms of its organic content and what organic content you can see it varies between 4 to 16 percentage in soil like material collected from aged waste whereas in the local soil it was found to be one percentage around one percentage however and then the next uh, classification was on the basis of its uh, geotechnical suitability that is on the basis of its mechanical properties so i think it is not that much clear in this uh, in the slide but uh, the point to observe uh, to note is that its shear strength is as good as that of the local soil means its geotechnical properties are fine with respect to the local soil however its contamination were some bothersome issue next slide please. i would request you wrap up because you have just one minute left now Sure. sure. Uh, so this is the comparison with the compost standard you can see it is uh, uh, well, it is having good proportion of nutrients in terms of NPK. However, some heavy metals that are highlighted here are high in, uh, with respect to the standards available uh, with us. So, uh, next slide, please. Next slide. Yeah. So finally, to conclude, uh, I can say on the basis of my research that it can't be used directly for offset applications without pretreatment because to use this material as soil, high organic content, total dissolved solids, sulfate, chloride, and heavy metals needs to be addressed. Whereas to reuse this material as compost, total organic carbon was, which was very essential parameter of compost, was found was found to be very less in soil like material from aged municipal solid waste so it can't be used directly as a compost and it can neither be used as uh, soil it has to be pre-treated to be reused uh, next slide so that's all about my presentation thank you thank you thank you mohit uh, thanks to all the presenters uh, for the informating and interesting presentations uh, so now we have come to almost the end for first round and now is the second is the question and answer round so we will randomly select questions from the audience and get their answers the first question is from uh, vishwas and his question is just a second Okay, let me take the first question from Annie. 
uh, question to Annie. Uh, the question is, is there any legal framework or legis legislation that mandates waste to energy conversion? Um, no. So as per the Indian regulations, which is the solid waste management regulations, the waste to energy is much lower down the uh, waste to energy hierarchy. But uh, there is also other sort of policy measures which are coming more from a business perspective because you have these industry players uh, who have uh, are pushing waste to energy technologies, saying that it's worked well in the West and therefore can work well in India as well. Um, so while there is no legislative backing around it, there is definitely um, sub subsidies being given to waste to energy plants. So um, there is Ministry of uh, Renewable Energy, which is giving heavy subsidies to waste to energy plants. So there is a policy push towards it, but no real regulatory backing around it. OK. There's a question from Asit to T.S. Krishnan. Um, hello, T.S. Krishnan. He would like to know your views on two-part instrument policies fair advanced disposal fees with a subsidy to consumers or firms when the good is properly disposed of. Yeah, hi. Hi, Shivani. Krishnan here. Hi. Yeah. Did you yeah. hear the so, question? Yes, yes. I heard the question. So right now in hi. our country, we do not have that kind of a system in place. But manufacturers are free to come up with incentive schemes so that the consumers are in incentivized to return the electronic products back to them. I think this is okay. my response to it. Yeah, it, it, it is a okay, good mechanism, you. but yeah, that's all. Thank you, thank you TS. Thank uh, you. Question, another question for Annie from Vishwas. Uh, have you had problems with resistance from residents when the waste management centers are in the neighborhood? Um, so it actually all depends on how well managed the center is. Um, if there is segregated waste coming to the community center and uh, the waste is managed well, we've actually seen increased participation from the residents. So what we also try to do is kind of involve the public. So we actually invite them to come and see what's happening in the waste management center. So that's how we take care of not in my backyard syndrome, which seems to be where people are most happy to just have waste being taken away from their house, but don't really know what happens. So the fact that they can come and see what is happening to their different kinds of waste increases their sensitivity towards waste as well. And, and for people working with waste. So finally, they also see who works with their waste. And therefore, that leads uh, to a situation where um, they are more sensitive towards it. There's better segregation levels. And therefore, there's increased acceptance of these uh, community uh, waste management units as well. So yes, we've seen actually a more of a positive than a negative reaction towards community centers. Thank you, Annie. A uh, question for Mohit. Uh, what quantity of waste uh, from the dump site was analyzed for the study? This is a question from Vishwas. OK. Am I audible now, Sh uh, Shivadi? Yeah, you're audible. Please go ahead. OK. Uh, so uh, initially, the waste collected from each landfill was uh, from five to six location. And uh, from every location, around two tons of waste was collected from the depth of five, uh, five meters. So in totality, we were having around 25 to 30 tons of waste from all the uh, four landfills. And after okay. uh, that, for the chemical analysis, it was uh, finally, with the help of coning and quartering te uh, technique, it was reduced to the uh, lesser volume needed for the testing. Thank you, Mohit. Uh, there's another question for you from Naveen. Okay. Uh, what was the heavy metals proposition which was found in SLM? Also, mm -hmm. which all heavy metals were detected? Okay, so in terms of heavy metal, chromium, copper, lead, zinc, uh, cadmium, and mercury, arsenic were determined. And uh, with respect to uh, local soil, uh, 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 chromium was found high, cadmium was found high, copper was found high, zinc was in limit, and lead, uh, lead was also in li limit, whereas arsenic was also found high. I, also, I already presented in my slide. OK, uh, can you show it in the slide? Uh, maybe sure. a few. Sure, sure. Uh, sure, 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 sure. Mm. Can you see my slides now? Yeah, we can see it. Yeah, maybe you can explain okay. now. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And Here, uh, it, oh, yeah. Mm. Is it visible? 
Hello, is it visible? This is fine. You, but you are on. Yeah, this is okay. Okay. You just have to uh, post, but it's okay. This is also fine. This is also fine. Right. Uh, so here is the comparison with the local soil. Uh, you see chromium, nickel, copper, zinc, arsenic, cadmium, and lead. These were the heavy metals which were determined. Now uh, see the nickel was almost uh, around uh, similar in heavy in local soil and soil like material from landfills. Whereas you can see zinc was high. You can see arsenic was in. Uh, more or less same whereas cadmium was high lead was high zinc was high and copper was high chromium was also slightly elevated is it okay do you need further explanation uh is that Rani, okay? Rani, you're on mute you have to unmute yourself <laughs> ah thank you yeah, it's fine, Mohit. Um, I yeah. think if anybody has any more questions, they can write to us or the present or the moderators and presenters. Um, so we will have the email IDs of all the presenters with us. Please feel free to write to us uh, after the session. Now, I think we would like to move to the second round of presentations after this. Uh, and we would like to now start with uh, our next presenter, Mubarak Mujawar from Malaysia. Mubarak Mujawar, your presentation title is Study and Optimization of Conditions of Biodiesel Production from Palm Oil Using Palm Kernel Shell Magnetic Catalyst. Mubarak is a PhD. He is an associate professor in Department of Chemical Engineering at Curtin University, Malaysia. He has published scientific significantly with over 100 peer-reviewed journal articles, six book chapters, 20 conference publications, and mm -hmm. Several international awards for his work he has received before. Mubarak, uh, the floor is yours. Please share your screen now. Mubarak, we can't hear you. Is your can you please check your audio? Check your mic, please. Uh, your, I see it. It is unmuted, but maybe your laptop audio or something is still turned off. Please check your mic again. I can't, still can't hear you. Um, I think there is a slight <laughs> problem. Uh, yeah, I can hear some sounds. No worries. Uh, so we can meanwhile move to our next speaker. Next presenter, uh, I would like to welcome our next speaker, uh, Dilawar Hussein Panwar from Pakistan, whose presentation is on <laughs> sustainable waste management systems for floating communities of Pakistan. Dilawar is a research scholar. He's a master's in water sanitation and hygiene. He's an urban planner and a water analyst. Dilawar, are you ready with your presentation? The floor is all yours. Yes, I am ready. Please go ahead. Where should I? Where, my presentation is. 
I have okay, to. Okay, you want us? I, we can view I the presentation. Said, do you want to do us? I mean, you want us to do that for you? Yes, yes. I have sent you my email. My yeah, yeah. Just. Twitter, can you please? Yeah. You can begin now. Hello, everyone. My name is Ilaw Rasen. I'm from Pakistan. I, I am MS scholar at US Pakistan Center for Advanced Studies in Water. And my title is Sustainable Waste Management System for Floating Communities of Pakistan. Please next. Introduction is there is a lake in Pakistan called Manchal Lake, and the people living on the surface of the water are these floating communities. Next, Manchal Lake is the largest shallow freshwater lake in Pakistan and one of the Asia's largest. The lake collects water from numerous small streams in Khitar Mountains and empties into the Indus River. Pakistan has been blessed with singular floating village located at Manchal Lake. Next, please. This freshwater lake is home to the floating villages, villages including numerous communities of people living in the drifting boats on the lake. Tragically, the life on the surface of the water does not have the essential elements concerning access to the safe drinking water and sanitation system. Next, please. The dwelling communities on the lake are utilize, utilizing this water for multiple purposes. For example, agriculture, business, fishing and drinking, other household purposes, and to stay day and night in the boats. There are varieties of unfavorable factors that are imposing influences on the health of floating inhabitants including waterborne diseases, non-appearance of a specific clause by a national wash legal framework. Next, please. This freshwater lake is home to the villagers. Next, please. Yes, sir, this is the Google Earth map of the lake. It is uh, we have surveyed through the Google Earth and it is the only floating village in the Pakistan. Next, please. Uh, this is a GIS, a thematic map through uh, GIS. Next. Showing the location of the... Our study's outcome will be... Our observatory study showed that Pakistan has only floating village located on Manchal Lake. It is the hottest spot for water pond diseases there for detection of pathogens will suggest more exposed population. The microbial risk assessment will reveal the high probability of at-risk people consuming water. By providing a sustainable waste management system, we will reduce the contamination load and generate the renewable energies like biogas and fertilizers. Results of this study will significantly provide a way forward to inter wash facilities. This all will ease the lives of floating communities and safety for the lake itself which will improve the SDG 6.1 and 6.2 of the targeted floating communities. The study will facilitate the provision of appropriate advice to the public and responsible authorities regarding the use and treatment of water. Thank you. This is the a paper I have published in the conference in my department, the second research national conference. The preliminary work has been published. Next. Thank you. Thank you, Dilawar. Uh, I would like to ask Mubarak, are you ready for the presentation? Shall we begin with your presentation, or would you need more time? Mubarak, can you hear me? Because I cannot hear you. I think Mubarak is not there. Uh, anyways, we will figure out uh, 
with Mubarak's presentation. Meanwhile, uh, we can move to our next presenter. Our next presenter would be Dr. Shri uh, Shalini from India. Her presentation title is Enrichment of Aerobic and Anaerobic Ammonia Oxidizing Bacteria from Solid Waste Dumps. Shalini is a scientist uh, in Center for Climate Change and Adaptation Research, Anna University, Chennai. Uh, she's a postdoctoral research in Mag uh, McGrill University, Quebec, Canada, and done her master's degree in environmental sciences. She has more than eight publications with her, and her mem she's also a member of several international associations. Shalini, the floor is yours. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Shivali. Um, thank I will you. share my slides now. Yeah. Hope uh, they can see the slides now. Uh, not yet. There is a screen share button on your uh, on yeah. the green button. On your... Yeah, I've shared the screen. slides uh, once again. This is it. Is it visible now? Yeah, this is fine. Okay, Shiny, you can go ahead. Uh, thank you, Shivali. Now I'm going to talk about uh, enrichment of aerobic and anaerobic ammonium oxidizing bacteria from solid waste dumps. Before moving on to the presentation, I'll say what is aerobic and anaerobic ammonium oxidizing bacteria and why it is so important to enrich these two bacteria in the solid waste. So when we see the country like India, we have a population of 1.45 billion, which is generating about 0.7 kilograms per capita per uh, Per, per day of municipal solid waste. So we can expect by 2025, it is estimated that 3,76,369 tons of MSW is going to be generated. And if you see the developing countries, most of the disposal methods for this MSW is the open dump sites. And the open dump sites is playing a major role in today's uh, scenario like climate change. So it is estimated that from India alone, from the waste sector, we are contributing 4% of the greenhouse gas emissions. So it is very important to treat our waste. So when we talk about the dump sites, two types of waste is getting accumulated in the dump site. One is the fresh MSW, another is the mined municipal solid waste. So I'm going to talk about the mined MSW, where, which is a partially degraded MSW. Uh, most of the organic content is degraded, but only the inorganic content is still an uh, issue in the solid waste. And inorganic content like uh, the ammonia nitrogen is a playing a very major threat to the environment and for the public health because the ammonia is not allowing the other uh, materials for the anaerobic degradation process is not happening. And it is also have a toxicity effect when it is getting leached into the receiving waters. So my main aim is to use this ammonia present in the mined MSW for enriching the these two bacteria. We have several ammonia removal processes and the novel process is share on and anamox processes. When compared to the conventional methods, they have a very less consumption of the oxygen and the carbon, and we also have other economical advantages. So the share on process is nothing but a partial nitrification process, an aerobic reactor. It is a single uh, reactor high activity ammonia removal over nitrate, where the ammonia is getting oxidized to nitrite. In an anaerobic ammonium oxidation process, it is an anaerobic process where the ammonia is getting converted to nitrogen gas. So to conduct these two processes, we require the key role bacteria of aerobic and anaerobic ammonium oxidizing bacteria. But when we want to apply this kind of process for a, a large volume of uh, solid waste for the ammonia removal, we require a mass quantity of biomass. So we thought of uh, culturing this bacteria in the municipal solid waste itself. In turn, these enriched MSW can be used for the ammonia removal. So the main objective of the study was to assess the feasibility of using the mined MSW dump for enriching the AOB and NOB removal. And these are the experimental setup that has been used for the study. And left side, if you see, that is the aerobic reactor, which we used for the enrichment of aerobic ammonium oxidizing bacteria. And the right side is the anaerobic reactor, which we used for the anaerobic ammonium oxidizing bacteria. So for an aerobic study, we maintained a uh, oxygen level of one milligram per liter. For the anaerobic condition maintained, we had uh, uh, injected the nitrogen gas inside the reactor so that the oxygen can be completely removed in the anaerobic reactors. So these reactors have run for a period of 250 days to see the 
how the enrichment is uh, prolonging for such a long days and what are the uh, different environmental conditions can affect these bacteria. So this is the slide showing the different operational conditions involved in the experiment. So we have an aerobic reactor and an anaerobic reactor. And we analyze these reactors for weekly to see the nitrogen uh, variations. And the initial loading for the aerobic reactor is in a ratio of 80 by 20 is the feed to seed ratio. The feed here is the enrichment medium. So in case of an AOB, the AOB enrichment medium is used for the uh, uh, enrichment of the aerobic ammonium oxidizing bacteria. So 80 by 20, 80% of the feed and 20% of the mined MSW. In an anaerobic reactor, it the feed to seed ratio is 60 by 40, where 60% is the anaerobic enrichment medium and 40% is the mined municipal solid waste. So the other analysis we carried out are the enrichment of uh, AOB can be analyzed by MPN tests. And we also look the bacteria morphology of the bacteria using SEM. And the standard procedures have been adopted for all the uh, chemical analysis like ammonia, nitrite, nitrate, and COD. And we also calculated the nitrate accumulation in the aerobic reactor by a term called partial nitration efficiency, where the, uh, with respect to nitrite and nitrate concentration, it has been calculated. And the inhibition of the free ammonia and free nitrous acid on different bacteria is cal mathematically calculated with respect to the pH temperature with respect to the ammonia and nitrate concentrations. So this is the physical chemical characteristics of the mined MSW. And this has been collected from the Chennai, which is a metropolitan city in Tamil Nadu state in India. And this waste is around two to three years of old. So when we see the total solid content, it is around 80%. So it is very good for a biological study. And the volatile solid content is also 13%. And if you see the uh, inorganic content of ammonia, nitrate, and nitrate, it is around 350 milligram per liter. So which is uh, useful for the current study of enrichment. So this is a nitrogen transformation uh, is shown in an aerobic reactor, where initially we loaded the ammonia concentration in a 50 molar of ammonium bicarbonate. And after a period of uh, 200 days, it has been reduced to less than 24 milligram per liter. And this is because the ammonia is getting converted into nitrite. So you can see the graph, the nitrate is getting increased in the uh, reactor, which shows that aerobic ammonium oxidizing uh, bacterial enrichment is taking place. And the nitrate concentration is also increasing a bit. That is because the main competitor for this AOB bacteria is the nitrate oxidizing bacteria. But we wanted to uh, enrich more of this aerobic ammonium oxidizing bacteria. So we maintained the pH and temperature condition in ambient level so that more than the uh, 30 degrees Celsius, the nitrate oxidizing bacteria cannot survive. And the free ammonia and free nitrous acid also is maintained so that only the AOB can sustain in the reactor rather than the NOBs. So uh, at the bottom, you can see the uh, graph, which is uh, showing the partial nitration efficiency. That shows that more than 88% of the nitrate is getting accumulated, which is a good sign for the ammonia nitrogen uh, which is a good sign for the aerobic ammonium oxidizing bacteria surviving in the reactor. And for in terms of the free ammonia and free nitrous acid, if it is more than 0.1 milligram per liter, the nitrate oxidizing bacteria cannot survive in a reactor or uh, cannot survive in an environment. So all our experiments showed that the free ammonia is always about 0.1 milligram per liter, where it shows that the competitor for AOB NOB is not surviving in the reactor. So the overall study showed that it had a removal of 95% from the 620 milligram of ammonia to 24 milligram per liter. And this is the slide shows the AOB biomass growth in an aerobic reactor, where uh, the initially we had only around uh, 800 milligram per liter, but after the 200 days of operation, it increased to 28,600 milligram per liter. It shows the growth of the biomass inside it. And we also viewed these biomass in the SEM and on the right side, you can see the same photographs where we have both cocci and some bacilli is seen. So that is because of the few population of the NOBs. And hydrazine and hydroxylamine graph is shown in the slide. That is because these two uh, intermediates are the intermediates of the Sharon and Alamox processes. So if even these two components are present, even in the trace amount, it shows that the aerobic, uh, aerobic ammonium oxidizing bacterial process is taking place in the reactor. So we had a sufficient amount of alkalinity present in the reactor. So for every conversion of ammonia to nitrite, we require equimolar concentration of uh, alkalinity. So 
that's why we also have a similar trend with respect of ammonia nitrate conversion with respect of the alkanity and uh, the mpn present in the reactor which also shows that from the initial it was only around 10 to the power 2 mn per mpn per ml but in the later stage it was increased to about 4000 times with increasing to about 10 past 6 mpn per ml and this is the graph uh, showing the enrichment of anaerobic ammonium oxidizing bacteria and where you can see here the ammonia uh, is it has to be converted to nitrogen gas by utilizing the nitrite and that's why you can see the uh, nitrite concentration is getting reduced and ammonia is also getting reduced the ammonia removal in this study is around 87 percent and the nitrite utilization rate is around 98 percent which shows that the ammonia is oxidized to nitrogen gas uh, with the formation of nitrate it shows that it is also confirmed that anaerobic ammonium oxidation process is taking place and that bacteria is enriched inside the reactor and similar to that of an aerobic study here also we analyze the free ammonia and free nitrous acid and the level inhibitory level is less than 0.2 milligram per liter for the NOBs and here also we saw that the nitrate oxidizing bacteria even though it is a competitor uh, because of the uh, reactor conditions it cannot survive for a long time and this is the graph showing the uh, variations of the hydrazine and hydroxyl amine. So the trace amounts of uh, 0.1 milligram per liter is also a very good uh, representative of the animox uh, growing in a reactor. And the MLSS population, yeah. Uh, sorry, but you have just uh, one minute left. Please try yeah. to wrap up. Yeah, it's over. Also, almost over. So the right side is the same. For, uh, photograph shows the population of the uh, anamox bacteria, and even the population was around eight thousand two hundred milligram per liter. So from this study, we can able to conclude based upon the ammonia removal and the different nitrogen profiles with the intermediate formation and the biomass development shows that the uh, solid waste can be used as a seed for enriching the aerobic and anaerobic ammonium oxidizing bacteria in turn that can remove the ammonia in the reactor so right side it's the pilot scale study we did so from the enriched uh, msw of aob and ob we loaded into a bioreactor landfills where uh, by conducting the sharon on amox process we could able to remove more than 80 percent of the ammonia so this has been proved that the msw can be used as a enrichment medium for bacteria which can solve uh, many problems and which will help in the environmental pollution control thank you so much for the opportunity i thank uh, ishwa and the young professional group thank you so much thank you shalini uh, this was a really detailed presentation um, as a reminder i would like to uh, in all of you you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control and presentations will be answered in the end during the Q&A session. So moving on to our next presenter, I would now like to welcome and our new presenter, Anaya Ghosh from India, whose presentation title is Energy Recovery from Municipal Solid Waste Dump Sites Using Bioreactor Landfills for Sustainable City Development. Anaya is right now pursuing her PhD in chemical engineering. She's, her PhD project is on bioreactor landfill modeling and organic fraction of municipal solid waste. She's also a member of several professional bodies. Anaya, uh, are you there? I this is audible. Hello. Yeah, you're audible, but your voice is a bit low. Can you uh, hear me? This is audible. Yeah, you are audible. Uh, can you use your earphones or? Okay, one second. Hello? Yeah. Audible? Yeah, it is audible. Okay. Thank Please you. share your screen. Yes. Uh, this is visible. Hello. Uh, not no. Your screen is not visible. If you like, we also have your presentation, and we can also play the presentation. Can you see? 
Can you, uh, yeah, yeah. I can see your screen. Please go on the slideshow mode. This is visible. No. Your your screen is not visible. This one. Uh, I can see you, but I cannot see your screen. Uh, so maybe you have to do a screen share again. One Yeah, your screen is visible now. You can do the slide show. Visible? Yeah, your screen is visible. Okay. Uh, if you can come to slideshow mode, that would be good. Full screen mode. Full screen mode. It is already in full screen mode. Uh, can you go to slideshow and start from beginning? Go to the slideshow option. Uh, you can see now my slides. Yeah, I can. I can see your slides, but I cannot see the full screen. If you can uh, go to slides, you might. Already, I uh, take this one, the full screen one. Can you click on the slideshow option on the top? There is a yeah the slideshow option on the top. You see, yeah on the yeah. This Press one. this. Yeah. No. Right one. Hello. I think yeah you can go ahead. Okay. Uh, uh, should I start? Hello. Yeah, I I actually cannot see your slideshow, but it's okay. Just go ahead. It's okay. Okay, slides are visible now. Yeah, their slides are visible. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, myself, I'm a coach in the Scholar Department of Chemical Engineering in the National Institute of Technology, Durgapur, India. Uh, today, I will uh, give a uh, presentation on the topic of energy uh, recovery from means of solid waste, uh, dump sites, using bioreactor and free for sustainable city development. These are my outlines. Before going to the main topic, I will uh, give a brief discussion on bioreactor ranking. It's a design, uh, design century landfill where proper gas collection system uh, is in, in beach and also the proper. And I have Yes. Uh, your slides are not moving. Maybe if you go on the slideshow again and try to do it, we okay. can see your slides again. But from here, I am changing my slide. Uh, I don't know. What okay. Uh, can you click on the slideshow again once more, please? This is the, my first uh, slide introduction. The second one. Yeah. Can you yeah. See this one, third one. Now it is it's okay. I think. Yeah, it is it is changing. Yeah, please go ahead. Okay. You can come to the slide where you want to begin now. Okay. Uh, please let me know whether it is visible or not. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. So, uh, we, uh, my main focus is uh, uh, design of a bioreactor landfill model uh, to, uh, uh, to reduce the, all the open dumps. Uh, means, uh, my aim is to open dumps to bioreactor landfill for energy recovery. So, before going to the main topic, uh, I will give a brief discussion on bioreactor landfill. It's a concept, it's a, a, an anaerobic basic, an anaerobic diet, decomposition system by organic fraction of municipal solid waste. Are uh, decomposed with the help of microbes, uh, and, uh, and uh, if we are giving mixed waste and all means mixed waste uh, from uh, open down to bioreactor uh, bio so microbes are very essential for uh, uh, reaction uh, in this reaction rate. And uh, it's, uh, this uh, bioreactor energy also having a proper uh, desulfuration system and also double lining system uh, and cover cover of the lining system so that the heated uh, whatever is generated in the decomposition, decomposition it should uh, it should not be contaminated with the ground waters and also uh, whatever the energy is uh, generated it should be stored and after that it should be uh, 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 it should be Compressed for uh, compressed as a uh, cooking, uh, compressed as natural uh, methane gas uh, uh, for uh, uh, cooking purpose or in uh, electricity generation. 
So uh, why should we go for bioreactor landfill? Uh, so we are talking about zero uh, landfill, uh, zero dumpster. Naya, your slides are not moving. Can you please also move your slides uh, along the way? Uh, so we are talking about, uh, now it is visible, changing. Your, yeah, please change your slide. Next slide. Okay, so we are talking about uh, zero focus uh, management or zero landfill. Still, we are dealing you with. Click, uh, sorry, you have to click on the slide on which you are right now. Can you click on the slide? Okay. And this one, yeah. Yeah, so please keep clicking all along okay. the way. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, uh, so we are dealing with uh, zero waste management. Uh, talking about zero landfill, still we are uh, dealing with the dump, open dumps, and also the uh, garbage dumpings. And so, uh, to mitigate all this challenge, uh, we are thinking about if we are, we are, we are uh, using this all the open dumps waste waste to the bio, uh, to bioreactor landfills. Uh, still, we are, we are facing lots of problems, but bioreactor landfill should be a uh, very Good and uh, very good uh, uh, technology and promising technology because uh, for uh, our uh, country like India, developing uh, countries, because uh, in uh, in previous uh, conventional or uh, traditional method, no proper light, uh, line or liquid collection system or also or no methane collection system was there. But uh, if we are talking about the bioreactor landfill for uh, modern generation, so there should uh, there uh, there is a uh, Proper lining system in the bottom and on the top, um, and the, above the top also, and our uh, leachic recirculation system is there. That that will enhance the degradation rate and and, and the stabilization of the uh, dumps uh, inside the bioreactor. Uh, the stabilization of the waste will be more quickly. You can see the um, height of the dump, dumps uh, means uh, reactor um, the waste materials inside the reactor is uh, quickly uh, in decrease and it. it it will be a, a in a certain time it will uh, uh, stabilize. After that, we can use that uh, these uh, landfills as a recreation uh, center or a cold spot like that. So uh, uh, now, uh, nowadays, uh, we should focus on the uh, uh, more on the bioreactor landfill uh, rather dump site or conventional um, uh, landfills. So what what. Uh, a research gap I found is uh, all work is, uh, all the work is uh, going on, but no work is such focusing on uh, developing countries. Uh, what should we do for do for our our uh, uh, dump sites? So my question is, uh, an objective also is to uh, mitigate all the uh, challenges of dump sites uh, to and uh, and, uh, and um, modify the bioreactor landfill design and also the sustainability of bioreactor landfill. Uh, whether it, it is sustainable in our uh, our uh, climate or uh, in our economical condition or not. So, uh, uh, my, from my perspective, uh, bioreactor landfill in developing nations like India, Bangladesh, uh, Pakistan, and um, is the uh, we are we all the country we are these countries we are facing a, a lots of problem in moisture content in our because our our waste is having 50 to 70 percent of organic waste so high moisture content is there so we, we should go for our um, biochemical uh, treatment technology rather than thermochemical like pyrolysis and gasification so anaerobic transition is a good process it should be uh, modified and enhanced and also the energy demand is very in high in, uh, in our uh, in, uh, countries, so and uh, and if uh, bioreactor landfill uh, is a big, uh, we will go for the bioreactor landfill. Then uh, the uh, um, global warming potential will be uh, very, uh, it will be reduced because uh, in, uh, in uh, case of dumping dump sites, all the methane is generating during the reactor uh, degradation process, but it is not close to one. Uh, so, uh, giving up, uh, if we see uh, all the dumps uh, to the bioreactor landfills, so uh, we can capture the methane and uh, that will be uh, uh, mitigate our uh, energy demands uh, some little bit. And also the groundwater contamination, we have to think about that thing. Also. So, in my uh, my PhD work, I develop a model for a small lab scale uh, where we are uh, doing uh, we are giving all the organic waste. Uh, uh, we, we are mixing all the organic waste with a, a small amount of waste plastic. We are thinking that it's a mixed waste like a dump size, and we are giving uh, to a to a anaerobic digester. And after that, uh, after a few days, uh, like 
uh, here I am doing uh, an experiment of 18 weeks and after that uh, we are uh, testing uh, the uh, energy uh, quality is uh, uh, how much methane is generated and also we are we did some, some uh, optimization using RSM response surface methodology and here is a result uh, you can see uh, with uh, having a uh, reactor uh, height to die ratio uh, uh, with a certain height to die ratio and uh, water content and also the waste uh, plastic amount we are giving and with a certain period we, we, are, we actually have uh, a good, good amount of methane uh, and uh, the correlation coefficient we can see uh, our square value is very good one and another uh, uh, experiment we are focused on because we are, uh, we are uh, living in a such a country there organic fraction of municipal solid waste is high and the moisture content is is a prime, prime one and uh, but the moisture content is a uh, you know moisture content is uh, fluctuating so we thought uh, 50 to 70 percent is moisture, moisture content so whatever i always collected from my uh, surroundings uh, i added 50 percent fluctuation and then did again that experiment and uh, same kind of good result i um, get uh, and uh, biogas generation is very good one uh, 12.75 uh, meter cube per ton i uh, got from that organic waste with uh, with the uh, optimum condition of waste per um, moisture content and digestion period and um, after all this I I uh, proposed a framework uh, which is uh, very uh, which is very uh, good for in our uh, in our country is um, climate because we, uh, here most of the cases segregation is a uh, main issue we faced here. So if we, uh, this is a model uh, where if the municipal solid waste is segregated, then all the segregated waste is uh, I am uh, showing it first uh, in the left one segregated waste if the collector then all that will go the expected uh, units um, and uh, if the waste is uh, the mixed waste then it should be go for the material recovery facility and after that it should be segregated and after the recycling unit you can see uh, at the one, then uh, from the recycled image, some waste plastic I am giving to the bioreactor landfill model as uh, whatever I uh, like my experimental work. So organic waste and like uh, some waste plastic are coming uh, to this uh, bioreactor landfill uh, uh, reactor and after that methane is generated. From methane, uh, whatever our energy given, uh, we are using at the electricity or upgradation unit for sale. And another mm, slide I will show you. Okay. Uh, some case studies I did uh, because to verify my experimental model whether it should be valid for uh, our environment, our climate or not. So Bombay IIT they are doing some um, um, uh, um, uh, bioreactor landfill model with the, um, to convert the open dumps to bioreactor landfill. Uh, they are uh, they are uh, in Kanjur Mark. They are they are having a landfill site, uh, huge landfill uh, um, dump site capacity is seven five zero zero tons per day, and they are having six uh, units of bioreactor landfill and also all the um, means of uh, their uh, that bioreactor landfill capacity three thousand tons of mixed waste and good amount of waste is collected and they are selling it also um, under the help of uh, PMC uh, Bombay Municipal Corporation 3.5 uh, uh, um, per unit which is 3.5 per unit they are selling instead of market um, means the market value is 7, per, seven uh, rupees per, um, per unit so it is very sustainable for us uh, and also the economical so um, uh, from the perspective of sustainability uh, Economical uh, point of view. Uh, if I, if we will compare from previous uh, open dump or the conventional method uh, and bioreactor landfill, bioreactor landfill will quickly it will uh, stabilize and it will give more uh, methane compared to the previous uh, models or open dumps. And also the environmental point of uh, point of view. I already told the global warming potential will less methane will capture, and also the groundwater contribution will be less because of rubber 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 liners are there. Social uh, the uh, sustainability is job opportunities because after the uh, closing of this landfill, uh, by we uh, can uh, create a recreation center um, 
local sport and more employments will be there and uh, last uh, my conclusion and recommendation is that we should more think about the sustainability part and whether it is feasible or not i am also uh, working on that uh, sustainability and life cycle assessment part for my model and um, uh, still, uh, we should need more focus on the landfills and uh, landfill. Um, think about the barrier to landfills and organic waste of uh, municipal solid waste management in uh, developing countries. If, um, uh, thank you for, for giving me, uh, me me this opportunity, uh, and also I thank uh, thank uh, my uh, professors uh, here and also. Uh, um, I thank my parents. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity. These are my uh, reference, and thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, complete. Hello. Thank you. Thank you, Anaya. Uh, I, I will now move to our last presentation of the day to Mr. Mubarak Mujawar from Malaysia. Uh, Mubarak's presentation's title is Study and Optimization of Conditions of Biodiesel Production from Palm Oil using palm kernel shell magnetic catalyst. Uh, Mubarak is a PhD, and he is also associate professor in Department of Chemical Engineering at Curtin University, Malaysia. He has published significantly with over 100 peer-reviewed journal articles, six book chapters, 20 conference proceedings, and such technical papers. Several international awards have also been offered to Mubarak. Uh, Mubarak, are you there? The floor is all yours now. Uh, Mubarak, I cannot hear you. Anaya, can you please mute yourself? I can see your uh, slides, but I cannot hear you. Can you please check your mic? I cannot hear you. Sorry. Uh, can you remove if you have earphones right now and just come to normal speaker? Maybe the earphones are not connecting. Barak, I cannot hear you. I can see your screen. Okay, I don't think we can we can figure this out right now. So let's close the fifth our presentations now, and I would now like to come to question and answer round. Mubarak, we cannot. Uh, maybe we can integrate you later on your presentation in the rest of the slides. Thank you, Mubarak. Um, I would now uh, request Vishwesh, my colleague, to take up the uh, presentations ahead. I mean, uh, the question answer round. Um, we have some questions from the presenter, from the attendee panel. We can have it here. Sweta, do we have any questions? OK. So my question is to actually Shalini. Shalini, uh, you said there are economical advantages to the Animox process. Can you please uh, mention a bit more on what kind of economical advantages does this process have over the other one? Uh, yeah, thank you for the question. In terms of the, uh, the uh, consumption of the chemical components involved in a, a biological processes, the anaerobic ammonium oxygen process has uh, very less. And even the gas emissions from these uh, processes in terms of uh, the methane and other gases is also uh, is not uh, coming out from these processes. So we also conducted a preliminary study and a pilot scale study. So I could see a, a vast difference in the uh, in terms of uh, climate change aspects, the greenhouse gas emissions is very less because whatever ammonia is present in the reactor initially, is completely getting converted uh, to the uh, nitrogen gas, which is, uh, we all know the nitrogen gas is present in the environment. And the cost with connected with this uh, process is also very less because we used only a polyvinyl PVC pipe for this uh, kind of studies. So with all these advantages, I say this, it is economically advantage. Okay, thank you, Shalini. 
the next question is for Anaya. Anaya, you mentioned about the biogas generation from the bioreactor landfill. Yes. And I suppose the biogas generation that you mentioned was really good. Are there some reasons that you were receiving such, uh, such high amounts of biogas in the landfill? Uh, because uh, if we will uh, uh, keep some microbes like Aldan and uh, if you will commercially purchase some microbes then it will in it automatically it will uh, increase the rate of the degradation. So uh, if uh, that gum uh, size or that waste is containing organic fraction uh, higher one, automatically methane will generate more. It depends upon the oh. organic fraction of municipal soil, how much amount it will contain. Okay. Thank you, Naya. Uh, again, thanks to all the participants for all the questions. I think this is it. We don't have any more questions now. Uh, I would now like to invite Vishwesh, uh, and he will take ahead the rest of the session. I think now you just have to close, Vishwesh. Uh, uh, can you please unmute yourself? I cannot hear you. Am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, you're audible. Please uh, take ahead. Sure. Thank, thanks, Shivali. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, this is Vishwesh from Bangalore, uh, India. I work with the United Nations uh, Development Program on a plastic waste project, uh, management project. Uh, it's called Prithvi. And uh, we have been uh, I've been associated with uh, uh, SY and the YPG since over three years now. Uh, it's a really great network to be a part of uh, in the solid waste management domain. That's in case you still aren't a part of it. And um, uh, I'd like to, you know, take this opportunity to thank all the participants for uh, uh, such incredibly engaging presentations. A big thank you to all our audience from uh, around the world who have joined our conference. And uh, this is a reminder that the best three presenters will be announced uh, in mid-September, and they will be contacted by email. Uh, for the first place, uh, the award uh, will be a 300 euro travel grant for the uh, S4 World Congress happening at Bilbao, Spain this year. And uh, the second place will be an ISWA membership for two years. Wow, that's really great. And third place is an ISWA membership for one year. Right? Uh, and all presenters will get their certificates of participation sent to their email. Uh, their abstracts will be published in the conference book, which will also be available on our website. So, right? Um, So, uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we now come to the end of the second ISWA YPG online conference, from downsides to a circular economy. How do we get there? On behalf of all the organizers and committee members, I would like to express my utmost gratitude to all the distinguished speakers, presenters, audience, and members of this flow for making this event a success. Now, I would like to leave you uh, with a quote by uh, Stuart Brand, an author and an innovative thinker, uh, who once said, we can see the past, but not influence it. We can influence the future, but not see it. Let us all be guided by things we've learned and heard through the conference and be able to see and influence our future. Uh, we seek your forgiveness for our shortcomings, if any, and uh, uh, that have been there through the conference. So till we meet again, perhaps in the next conference, may all of you remain safe and happy. Thank you. Good morning. Today I'm going to present uh, study in optimization conditions of biodiesel production from palm, palm oil using palm kernel magnetic catalyst. What is actually the problem statement? Why so expensive? Oil feedstock contributes 77 percent of total operating cost, only profitable up to 50 to 80, per, 80 kilotons per year, and loss of interest from the government and entrepreneurs. Government conventional biodiesel production associated with the high production cost and conventional catalyst is expensive so not eco-friendly and difficult difficulty to be recovered so this is the actually the problem statement in order to overcome this one so we develop a magnetic uh, catalyst to synthesize a magnetic biochar from palm kernel cell as a catalyst through a sulfonation process 
for biodiesel production. To evaluate the magnetic catalyst characterization, to study the optimum con operating condition for transesterification by using uh, a response surface methodology via central composite design. Uh, this is the research methodology where we had preparation of the palm corner magnetic bachelor with respect to the sulfonation process as a catalyst. And then after that we need to use for production of uh, biodiesel sample based on the, the RSM CCD techniques and perform GC FID to test find out each sample yield and ANOVA analysis and regression models and optimization of via RSM method and experimental validation of the predicted and optimized conditions values. Okay. If you look at back these, uh, the SEM images from the uh, average particle size from 123 nanometer to 135 nanometer before loading to the sulfonation uh, SO3 uh, groups and after sulfonation more compact and you can see the from the big figure B and, and D. You can see more compact and coarser and show the greatly porosity improve the mass transfer, improve the catalyst efficiency, not much difference especially in terms of stability and inflexibility carbon framework at 800 degree carbonation that resist the H2SO4 attack and unable to perform the BET due to the surface area and pore size volume of the uh, material of biochar. And if you look at back the we have done some characterization study on the energy dispersion, energy dispersion studies where you can also you can see that after the sulfuration the presence of uh, presence of sulfur is present on the, uh, the EDX images and you can see drop of Fe contained after sulfuration for example 64 percent to the 19 percent uh, it indicates that the iron content is reducing and sulf uh, sulfuration process is uh, valid. And lack of protect uh, and we, we have done some called as a proactive coating leaching of Fe3O4 and Fe3C into the sulfuric acid solutions. And we can look at the figure from the A and B, it is very clear that the, the sulfone, uh, presence of sulfone, uh, sulfur is present in the energy diffraction studies. And also we have studied the vibrating sample magnetic meter. Before sulfonation, you can see the, the, the trend is from the A, 37.65 EMU by gram. And after sulfonation, you can see that it is getting to the ready uses. The significant 78 percent drop of the, the vibrating, uh, the magnetic uh, material can be dropped and lack of protective coating and that can be help us to use the, uh, by mentioning just now uh, uh, sulfuric acid solution by using the leaching techniques. And we also perform the Fourier transform in from right spectrometer and you can see <coughs> that wavelength is about 554 the FeO is present and wavelength at 105450 you can see the uh, oxygen, sulfur and the groups are present and wavelength at 131430 you can see and 1465 symmetric and asymmetric of sulfur and oxygen stretches are fine and successful loading of SO3 groups on the, the FTR images and acid density we found it is about 1.92 mm mole per gram. And you can see from the Greek graph A and B it is clearly indicate that the after sulfonation definitely the, the, the functional groups are attached on the surface of the magnetic biochar. And also we also perform the thermodegrammetry metric analysis. You can see from the part A and B, A is a before sulfonation and B is after sulfonation. And you can see from the each and every uh, temperature range we have find out that what is the, the between the temperature range is minor weight loss about 200 degree temperature. After 200 to 800 degree the total weight loss is about 16.81. This is due to the lignose uh, decomposition of lignose and lignose content. And after, after the sulfonation you can imagine it at 150 degree temperatures and you can see the minor weight loss is about 8.81. So between 150 to